Uh, this evening, uh, we're not going to continue in our series in 2 Samuel. Uh, I hit a bit of a wall in my preparation for this Sunday. Uh, the sermons in Daniel have, ta- have involved a bit more study than usual. I've uh, been deep in the weeds for the last couple of weeks. And I also had to work through that difficult passage in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 for the home groups, that passage about head coverings. So my my brain is a bit fried. And I need, and perhaps you need, something a bit more devotional, uh, something to warm our hearts and encourage us. So this evening we're going to have another message from the Gospel according to John. I brought a little series this year that I've called Jesus in John. Uh, This will be message number 11 in the series, and it's going to be quite short. We're going to briefly consider one of Jesus' most famous miracles, probably his most famous, given that it is the only one that's recorded in all four Gospels. Please, if you would, open your Bibles to John chapter 6. The Gospel according to John chapter 6. And uh, when you get there, please follow along as I read from verse 1 through to verse 15. Uh, Very familiar words. After these things, Jesus went over the Sea of Galilee, which is the Sea of Tiberias. Verse 2. And a great multitude followed him, because they saw his miracles which he did on them that were diseased. And Jesus went up into a mountain, and there he sat with his disciples. And the Passover, a feast of the Jews was nigh. When Jesus then lifted up his eyes and saw a great company come unto him, he saith unto Philip, Whence shall we buy bread that these may eat? And this he said to prove him, for he himself knew what he would do. Philip answered him, Two hundred pennyworth of bread is not sufficient for them, that every one of them may take a little. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, saith unto him, There is a lad here which hath five barley loaves and two small fishes, but what are they among so many? And Jesus said, Make the men sit down. Now there was much grass in the place. So the men sat down in number about five thousand. And Jesus took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed to the disciples, and the disciples to them that were set down. Likewise of the fishes as much as they would. When they were filled, he said unto his disciples, Gather up the fragments that remain, that nothing be lost. Therefore they gathered them together and filled twelve baskets with the fragments of the five barley loaves, which remained over and above unto them that had eaten. And those men, when they had seen the miracle that Jesus did, said, This is of a truth that prophet that should come into the world. When Jesus therefore perceived that they would come and take him by force to make him a king, he departed again into a mountain himself alone. This is the word of the Lord. Amen. Let's pray together. Father, again we thank you that we can meet together this evening. Thank you for the privilege of praying together. And we are confident that our prayers, as humble and as weak as they are, have been heard in the very throne room of heaven. And uh, as our brother uh, reminded us, we look forward to the day when we will be in the presence of the one to whom we pray. We ask now, Father, that you would help us to understand uh, the scripture before us. Please encourage us this evening. Uh, and we commit ourselves and this meeting into your hands in Jesus' name. Amen. When we read the account of this miracle... We're supposed to think of two characters in the Old Testament. The first and most obvious is Moses. And indeed, Jesus would go on to make that connection with Moses and with the manna when he taught the people the day after he fed them. The other figure in the Old Testament that is alluded to here is Elisha. Now, let me read to you some verses from 2 Kings chapter 4, and I think you'll pick up on the parallel straight away. 2 Kings chapter 4 verses 40 to 42 it says and there came a man from Baal Shalisha and brought the man of God bread of the first fruits 20 loaves of barley and full ears of corn in the husk thereof and he that's Elisha said give unto the people that they may eat 
And his servant said, what, should I set this before an hundred men? He said again, give the people that they may eat. For thus saith the Lord, they shall eat and shall leave thereof. That is, they shall eat and there shall be some left over. So he set it before them and they did eat and left thereof. That is, they had some left over, according to the word of the Lord. So like the situation here in John chapter 6, there wasn't nearly enough food to feed everyone, but the prophet said, give to the people that they may eat, and there was enough. Everyone ate, and there was some food left over. It was a miracle of multiplication. So there was Moses and the manna, and there was Elisha, who fed a large group of people with a small amount of food. And again, we're supposed to think of these men when we see what Jesus did here. There is a sense in which Jesus, by way of this miracle, was showing himself to be the fulfillment of the law, Moses, and the prophets, Elisha. He was showing himself to be the one the law and the prophets pointed to. We could reflect on this aspect of the miracle a lot more. Its connection to the Old Testament and what it communicated to the people who were present that day as well as to those who read the account of it in the New Testament. We must always read the life and ministry of Jesus in the Gospels with an eye to the Old Testament. But that's not what I want to focus on with you this evening. I want to concentrate on three details in the story. And that will lead into the thought that I want to leave with you. Detail number one. Notice Jesus' interaction with Philip. Jesus turned to Philip because he knew the area well. He was from a town close by. He was the disciple who would have known what was in the town. You know, how many bakeries? Uh, how many stalls where people could purchase food? Hey, was there a Woolworths or just a little IGA? And Jesus said to Philip, verse 5, Whence or from where shall we buy bread that these may eat? And what Philip was effectively saying when he answered Jesus was, Nowhere. And that there isn't anywhere in this area where we could buy enough food to feed a crowd this size. That was the implication. But let's look carefully at what he said. Verse 7, Philip answered him, 200 penny worth of bread is not sufficient for them that every one of them may take a little. The scholars tell us that this amount, 200 pennies, was the equivalent of eight months wages for a day labourer in Galilee. So Philip was saying eight months wages worth of bread wouldn't be enough to feed these people. It wouldn't be enough even for everyone to have a little bit, just a bite. Now, hold on to this image. Imagine that the disciples could have purchased this much bread and shared it out. Imagine everyone in the crowd of perhaps 20,000 people uh, having just one bite, one tiny piece of bread. And I'll come back to this later on. Detail number two. Notice Jesus' interaction with Andrew and the lad. Verses 8 and 9. Look there again, please. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, saith unto him, There is a lad here which hath five bar barley loaves and two small fishes, but what are they among so many? Uh, no doubt we've heard this before, but it's likely that the lad volunteered to share his food. We don't know how or why, but it makes for a, a wonderful Sunday school story. The main point was that it was nowhere near enough. It was an absurdly small amount, given the size of the crowd. That's what we're supposed to see. And this is where we're supposed to think back to Elisha. And then detail number three. Notice how much food Jesus provided. Now I'll read that section of the text again, beginning at verse 10. And Jesus said, make the men sit down. Now there was much grass in the place, so the men sat down in number about 5,000. So that's 5,000 men, and who knows how many 
women and children were with them. And Jesus took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed to the disciples and the disciples to them that were set down. And likewise of the fish, fishes as much as they would. When they were filled, he said unto his disciples, Gather up the fragments that remain, that nothing be lost. Therefore they gathered them together and filled twelve baskets with the fragments of the five barley loaves, which remained over and above unto them that had eaten. Now we all know there were twelve baskets left over, right? Why twelve? Is that symbolic? Maybe, <laughs> maybe not. Uh, that's a question for another day. But have you ever noticed what it says at the end of verse 11? It says, as much as they would. They ate as much as they wanted. That's what it means. And only in John's account do we have this little detail. So, picture the disciples distributing the bread and the fish that Jesus was miraculously, miraculously multiplying. Imagine they came to a man and they handed him some bread and some fish and he said, can I have some more? I'm really hungry. The disciples didn't say, look, we're sorry, but that's all we can give you because we've got to feed everyone. That didn't happen. Instead, the disciples would have said, sure, here's some more. And they would have handed him more bread and more fish. Jesus provided enough for everyone to eat as much as they would. Everyone ate until they were full. And even then, there was food left over. Now, let's go back to that image I introduced earlier. Imagine that the disciples could have purchased the 200 penny worth of bread and shared it out. Imagine everyone in that crowd of perhaps 20,000 people having just one bite, one tiny piece of bread. Now, put that next to what actually happened. Jesus provided for them as much as they wanted to eat. And they were full. The New Testament scholar D.A. Carson sums it up this way. What John stresses is the lavishness of the supply. The people ate as much as they wanted, far outstripping the tidbit that even 200 denarii would have failed to supply. But the following day, the crowds again flocked to Jesus. And because he knew that the bread from the day before was on their minds, he taught them about bread, about what he called the true bread from heaven, the bread of God. And as we know, he was talking about himself. Jesus is the bread of God which comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. I am the bread of life, he famously said in verse 35. He was talking about spiritual bread and spiritual life, everlasting life, salvation. The day before, Jesus had fed the multitudes with bread until they were full. Verse 12 says, when they were filled, he said unto his disciples, gather up the fragments that remain. And their hunger was satisfied. They had all the nourishment they needed to make the journey home. What did Jesus say about the true bread? The bread of life. Verse 35, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger. And he that believeth on me shall never thirst. Just as Jesus completely satisfied their physical hunger with physical bread, so he would completely satisfy their spiritual hunger with spiritual bread, with himself and with his salvation, if they believed on him. The day before, they didn't get just one little bite that left them hungry. Rather, Jesus provided all they needed. And he would do exactly the same spiritually and forever if they would trust in him. Not just a little bit of forgiveness that would leave them needing more. Not just a few steps towards reconciliation with God and they'd, they'd have to make up the rest. 
not just a half serve of righteousness and they have to work on achieving the rest, no. A complete and sufficient salvation, everything they required to be right with God. Everlasting life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger, and he that believeth on me shall never thirst. And here's the thought that I want to leave you with this evening. When Jesus talked about never hungering and never thirsting, he was talking about salvation. He was talking about regeneration and justification. When we believe on him, we receive everlasting life. We are saved forever. His work is complete and it completely saves us. But with that said, I believe there is an application here or perhaps an illustration that is pertinent to the Christian life. A truth here to encourage us as we endeavour to live faithfully. It's in that little detail that only John records. Look again, please, at verse 11. And Jesus took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed it to the disciples, and the disciples to them that were set down, and likewise of the fishes, as much as they would. There was enough bread for everyone to have as much as they wanted. And the same is true of the spiritual bread that Jesus provides. The same is true of Jesus himself. We can have as much of him and of his benefits as we want. We never have to go hungry. We never have to feel dissatisfied inwardly. But sometimes we do, don't we? And the fault is not his. It's ours. Jesus doesn't portion himself out. And that's all we can have. He doesn't portion out his love or his wisdom or his peace or his joy and say, well, you can only have this much today and no more. He doesn't offer us just a bite, just a tiny crust. No. No. Jesus is generous and kind, full of love, full of compassion. His beneficence knows no bounds. We can eat at his table. We can receive from his hand as much as our heart desires until we are full and overflowing. In the words of Psalm 107 verse 9, he satisfieth the longing soul and filleth the hungry soul with goodness. I think it's true to say that from time to time we all wrestle with dissatisfaction and discontentment. Uh, We all wrestle with anxiety and frustration, especially as we get older. Uh, As adults, we have to do things, maybe lots of things that aren't much fun. Uh, We have to persevere in a job that's not always that interesting and that sometimes might be very difficult. And we have to do the right thing by our children. And we know we have to be patient with them and encourage them and discipline them and so on. And that's not always easy. Uh, We don't always feel like doing that. And coming to church week in and week out can become a bit of a drag as well. In summer it's hot, we're tired, we don't always get a lot out of it. And sometimes people annoy us. And then let's be honest, let's be really honest this evening... Sometimes we look at the way the world lives and the grass seems to be quite a bit greener. They seem to be having such a great time. Their lives look much easier than ours. And this is when dissatisfaction begins to seep in. This is when it can start to take hold in our heart. Discontentment, frustration, even resentment. We're all tempted this way. I get it. I feel it too. But brothers and sisters, here's the message for our hearts this evening, the message in this text. Jesus is always present, holding out to us all the bread that we could ever need and want. He is holding out to us the bread of God, that which will actually satisfy us and strengthen us, that which will enable us to persevere and not only persevere grimly 
but to persevere with joy, real joy. And we can have as much as we want, as much of him and of his benefits as our heart desires. What we have to do is come to him and receive it. This is where personal responsibility comes into the picture. We have to come to him and receive what he is holding out. And we do that by the ordinary means, through prayer and through reading and meditating on his word. This is how we sit down at his table and eat the bread that nourishes our soul, that satisfies us inwardly and that strengthens our resolve to do his will. The young lions do lack and suffer hunger, the psalmist says. But they that seek the Lord shall not want any good thing. Christ will satisfy our hungry souls every day in every circumstance if we will come to him. He will give us all we need and even more. May God help us. And may he encourage us this evening through the preaching of his word. Amen.